tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This is a warning. My best friend tried to warn me, and I didn't listen. Now all that's left is a shell, a broken man. All I need is for one of you to understand, and I've done my job. Owen was my pal. Maybe the best one, if I had to rank them. One of the good guys. He didn't have many friends. We met in high school, drawn together by a mutual love of turn-based strategy games. Master of Orion, Heroes of Might and Magic. Owen was an absolute beast at those games. He had a queer talent for memorizing patterns, statistics, and maps. He'd devour games like a man possessed, teasing out exploits and secrets while the rest of us were still getting our butts handed to us by the AI. Even five years out of college, Owen remained thin as a rake, his eyes looking perpetually surprised through thick spectacles. Life happened to the rest of our little circle of friends. We went corporate, chased the dream, ran the rat race. We never kept in touch like we should have, other than meeting up every few months for a meal. I gathered that he worked in a bank somewhere, cruising along and meeting his targets without excelling. The last time I saw Owen was a little over four months ago. He had arranged to meet me at one of our favorite bars in a quiet part of town. At least it used to be until jobs and the pressure of grown-up life just expanded and expanded, filling up my life like so much bubble wrap. I got to the bar first, or so I thought. I searched the crowd fruitlessly until my eyes focused on a lone figure in a scruffy coat sitting at the bar. I had to swallow a gasp as the man turned around. I hadn't seen Owen in the better part of a year, but he looked like he'd aged a dozen he was thin before, but now he was nothing more than skin and bones. His cheeks were sunken in, unshaven, with a wispy beard framing his mouth. He smelled of sweat and grime and worse. One thing hadn't changed. His eyes still blazed with a fierce intelligence. He gestured toward the seat next to him. When he spoke, the words came out in a rush. He'd found something, he said. He'd found a, a warning scribbled upon an old map he'd seen in a library. It pointed down a street somewhere in the city that he hadn't been able to find on modern maps or even Google. Still, he hunted it down and found a back alley, a nameless lane between two buildings that shouldn't have been there. Intrigued, He'd gone back to the library and found another two maps with warnings in handwriting distinct from the first. They were published years apart, yet seemed to be warning readers away from similar nameless streets. Owen grew more animated as he spoke, gesturing wildly, a small crust of white spittle forming at the corner of his mouth. He'd found more of the lanes the maps warned about, cracks between buildings that shouldn't have been there. Hidden alleys. I saw the familiar glint of obsession in his eyes. He'd found something special, a hidden system, and he wouldn't rest until he had laid bare its secrets. He stopped short, his eyes widening at something through the window across the busy street. I turned around to see what had spooked him, but the throng of people at the bar and the street blocked me. Hands shaking, he teased out a tattered map from his pocket. It was covered in his handwriting, too small to make out by the light of the bar counter. He marked a spot and hurriedly folded up the map, which quickly disappeared into his pocket. It's big. Something big, something hidden. I've almost got all the places. I'm almost there. I can't move fast enough. 
I'll need something faster. So that's what he wanted. Just to borrow my car for the weekend. I gave him a look that was equal parts pity and derision. Pity for the friend I knew, and derision for the madman twitching before me. It wasn't the first time I'd let him drive my car, but I had no idea what had gotten into Owen, and I wasn't even sure that I'd get my vehicle back in one piece. In the end, his plaintive wheedling got the better of me, and I agreed to let him have my car for the weekend. I wished to God I hadn't. I didn't hear anything from Owen that Saturday, or the day after. He didn't pick up his mobile the entire night. I had to get a cab on Monday morning and plan to take my mounting frustration out on Owen after work. Friendship be damned. His antics seemed more like college hijinks than something an adult should be playing at. I checked my phone as I left my apartment. A text from Owen. Car at my place. I was wrong. Burn map. Leave nothing behind. Don't come after me. I was sufficiently unnerved by the message to leave work early. I hadn't been to Owen's apartment in years, but I still remembered the way. I saw my car parked out front, a cup of coffee in the cup holder, and a huge map of the city, densely annotated, unfolded on the passenger seat. I made my way up the stairs. The door to the apartment was open. Owen wasn't inside. His mother was. Her face crumpled with a grief that no parent should know. Owen's home was a wreck, his mental decline clearly reflected in his apartment. Maps, photographs, and sheets of paper covered in his handwriting blanketed every possible surface. Between gulping sobs, she explained how she'd just come back from the morgue to identify his body. He'd been in a pretty nasty hit-and-run accident the morning before. The cop said he must have been dragged for quite a distance. Facial identification was impossible. She only managed to identify him through his personal effects and a tattoo on his upper arm. Or at least a tattoo that used to be on his upper arm. The accident had sheared a chunk of flesh right off of him and she had to identify pieces of her son's body laid out on the cold metal of a gurney. Owen's father and brother came by with the funeral director then. I excused myself, leaving the family to the grief. As his friend, I should have offered my help, but I needed to leave the house. Owen had been found on Sunday morning. I whipped out my phone to verify what I already knew. He tested me at 3 a.m. on Monday morning. My head was still spinning when I got into my car. The shock of Owen's sudden passing and the chill left by the text message this morning danced nauseatingly in my head. Was the conversation in the bar all I had to remember him by? I unfolded the map. Owen's spidery writing covered almost every available space. He'd been writing with an energy and speed which turned his usually neat script into an illegible scrawl, so forceful in places that the cheap ballpoint pen had punched through the paper. He'd marked out dozens of locations on the map with crude stars, each accompanied by annotated times and dates. The rest of the text made no sense. There were scribbled symbols that didn't match any language that I knew of. The snatches of English that I could decipher made no more sense than the symbols, products of Owen's obviously addled mind. They watched the cracks, nameless streets, secret kings and queens of the city. They sing to the dead. They eat their lost. The meaningless text still sent a chill down my spine. The depths of my friend's madness shocked me. I couldn't fathom why he would ask me to destroy the map. Lost in my troubled thoughts, I started my car. A polite chime snapped me from my reverie. It came from a shiny black slab on my dashboard. A GPS unit. Not mine. Owen's. 
a strange thing for him to own since he didn't have a car to start with. I looked at the tiny LCD screen. I was at a location that Owen had marked out. His home? No, it was slightly off, across the street. It looked to be in the middle of a building, or a shop maybe. The streets were empty of both pedestrians and cars, but something felt out of place. No, the street wasn't totally empty. There was a small lane, practically just a crack between two buildings right next to my car. A waifish teenage girl was standing there, dressed in tatty jeans and a plain, threadbare t-shirt, far too thin for the icy winter weather. No shoes, either. She wore a look of intense focus on her face, her dark, piercing eyes staring upwards towards Owen's apartment. Her face was perfectly formed, pale, but covered in streaks of dirt. Her blonde hair matted into crude deadlocks. She seemed perfectly at ease in the cold, as though she could feel my eyes on her. Her head snapped downwards, and she affixed me with her mesmerizing gaze. I felt transfixed like a butterfly pinned to a corkboard. Her bright pink tongue snaked out from between her dirty lips, and the pointy tip ran across her lips in anticipation. I looked back at the GPS unit. There shouldn't have been an alley where she was standing. It should have been a continuous block of buildings. When I looked up, she was gone again. Unnerved by the nameless lane and the vanishing girl, I drove off a little faster than I should have. I must have driven at least five blocks when I heard the little chime from my dashboard again. Another star in the map. Same as before. A lane existed where there shouldn't have been a break in between the buildings. I nearly slammed on the brakes in shock when I saw the girl again. There was no way she could have made the distance between my last stop and this one on foot. I racked my brain for a logical explanation as the car cruised by. A sister? Or did she have a car on a parallel street? I found her giving me that same intense look, a familiar, hungry look. It had to be the same girl. She craned her neck to follow my car as I drove by like a snake staring down a mouse. I watched her shrinking into the rearview mirrors for as long as I could. Then I floored the accelerator, trying to get as far from her as possible. Rubber squealed on the black asphalt. I put about seven blocks between us when the polite chime from my dashboard sounded again. Adrenaline pumped through my system. My gaze swept across the empty streets. There she was again. It had to be the same girl. She caught my gaze with her own piercing look and smiled at me. Now, it wasn't a smile. She pulled her lips up and back and bared her straight white teeth. But there was neither humor nor warmth in the expression. It brought to mind the image of a baboon or wolf facing down something small and helpless. She abruptly turned and scuttled down the almost hidden alley. I stopped the car. Owen had found something. I hadn't done right by him in the last few days, so I owed him at least enough to learn how he died. I rounded the corner mere seconds after the girl. The alley was empty. Rough cement walls stretched to the sky, blocking out the tired light of the evening sun. She had vanished in the scant seconds it had taken me to get to the mouth of the tiny, nameless alley. My pulse quickened as I made my way down the tight corridor. My walk turned into a trot and the trot into a sprint. By the time I had reached the end of the end of the street, my chest was heaving, constricted by bands of hot iron. My breath steamed in the cold evening air. She wasn't there. There weren't any alcoves or windows or turnoffs anywhere down the alley. I hit the end of the lane and peered down the adjacent street. No trace of the girl and no alleyways she could have turned down. No doors or windows she could have climbed through. Nothing except the empty street. With a familiar car parked by the side of the road. My car. I had walked a hundred yards 
through a straight alley and wound up back where I started. I felt the world spin around me. I had put my hand on the wall to steady myself. What had Owen found? What was he searching for before he died? How was it possible for a straight alley to start and end at the same place? Large goats of mist shot from my mouth as my chest heaved. There was something unnatural about this place, something wrong in the air. I felt strange grooves under my hand as I pushed on the wall to straighten up. Someone, or something, had carved a series of strange symbols on the wall. Now I know where Owen had gotten those scribbled hieroglyphics from. He'd seen them, too. He must have been trying to decipher it like some code. Typical for him. I cast a final look straight down the strange, empty alley. The girl was still nowhere to be seen. I left the strangest of the alley behind me as I made my way back to my car. My breath misted on the cold window as I cast one final look toward that crack between buildings, that nameless space. The nameless space with the same girl staring out at me. The temperature was close to freezing outside, but I finally realized what had unnerved me about that silent tableau. All that time I was staring at her. I hadn't seen her breath mist up on the crisp evening air. What I saw that day filled up my waking moments like a creeping itch. I would find my eyes magnetically drawn to the hard, plastic shell of my glove compartment on the slow commute to work. Owen's mysterious map and GPS skidded around within their prison like caged rats when I took turns just a little too hard, reminding me of their presence. Owen had stumbled onto something strange, and it had consumed him. I'd gone to the funeral with the expressed intention of handing over the map and the GPS to Owen's family. The empty rows in the church showed just how far he'd taken his search. No colleagues, barely any friends, the odd family member. He'd lost his job months ago, cut off almost all contact with the outside world. Owen's mother had aged a decade since I last saw her. The raw shock of her son's death replaced with a bone-deep sorrow, painfully obvious in the crinkles in the corners of her eyes, her sunken cheeks and her haunted, leaking eyes. I had whispered my commiseration, saying how sorry I was, as the truth of the map and Owen's last warning poised at the back of my throat, like a wave of bile. I choked the secrets back where they sat in my gut, swollen and sour. I had to find out more. I spent hours trying to decipher Owen's writing, looking for a pattern in the crazed scribblings. I lacked his skill with codes and systems. There was no pattern I could discern from the constellation of marked locations. No hidden message leapt out from his ravings. There was only one other thing to try. The day was cold, I remember, even for midwinter. Not a skin cold, but one that could cut through your clothes, seeped in with every breath into your lungs. A deep bone cold. I returned to the first three alleys where I'd seen the girl. I found nothing. They were totally empty, in stark contrast to the busy streets just a few yards away. It was getting dark by the time I got to the fourth point marked on the map. The crowd on the sidewalk had thinned out as the chill got deeper. Owen's handwriting was impossible to read in the weakening light. I rounded the corner and I saw another person. He could have been a brother or a twin to the girl I'd seen before. Same blonde hair, a simple fitted t-shirt, jeans barefoot on the biting cold concrete. He gave me a sardonic stare. He looked to be gnawing at something, a chicken wing or something similar, with great gusto. 
He stretched his mouth open to suck the last ounce of flavor off the little morsel before drawing the bleached bone from his mouth and flinging it into the distance. He grimaced as though he'd bitten into something sour. His eyes still locked with mine, he opened his mouth and rooted around with a questing finger. Finding what he'd been looking for, he hooked a huge, grayish chunk out of his mouth and delicately set it on the floor. He turned abruptly, took three deliberate steps to his right, and vanished around a turn. I rushed forward to see what he had laid on the ground. I wish I hadn't. It was a ring. Class of 06. Still slick with saliva on the outside, but sticky red with blood and shreds of tissue on the inside. I instinctively clutched at the identical ring I wore on my index finger. The boy hadn't been chewing on a chicken wing. He'd been chewing on Owen's finger. The smell of blood hit my nose, sharp and rich through the evening chill. My last meal rushed out of me in a flood and sat hot and steaming on the cool ground. I turned to face the small nook the boy had walked into. Nothing. Like the girl, he'd vanished. All that lay before me was a featureless dead end. No, not featureless. Something that nobody else could have seen. Nobody but Owen and me. There, in the delicate spiderweb of cracks on the concrete, drawn out in a thin black filigree on the wall, was another of the symbols for Owen's map. When does a search become an obsession? And when does that obsession burst into mania? Owen's degeneration was clear as day to me, but my own descent was far more subtle. The terrible damage of the accident had visited one final indignity on Owen and his kin. They had to pay their respects to the polished wooden veneer of a closed casket. Had it really been my dear friend in that box? There must have been a few hundred of those rings pressed out. It could have belonged to anyone in my graduating year. Yet, I knew, deep inside of me, that it had to be Owen's ring I picked up off the cold cement wet with spit and blood. My search began in earnest, then, to seek out what he had found, hoping beyond reason that I would find my old friend somewhere along that path. It started innocently enough. I'd spend a free evening after work wandering the streets, following Owen's map, each location like another morsel on a trail of breadcrumbs. It was maddening. I again got the sense of a deeper pattern behind the randomness and cursed myself for being unable to see it. Each site I visited seemed to hold a piece of the puzzle. I grew adept at finding the hidden symbols in the cracks in the city. I found a set of three hidden within spray-painted tags on a wall, one more in the carefully arranged guts of a dead rat, its bowels burst and strewn about. Another, woven into the silken threads of a spider web, stretched between gray concrete and a rusty dumpster. Those hidden lanes and alleys were always deserted. It could have been lunch hour or rush hour. The streets thronged with people, and they would still be empty. I'd walk down those plain blank concrete canyons hour after hour, always feeling watched, never feeling alone. I never saw another living soul in those lanes and alleys during my search, but the hairs on the back of my neck would always rise once I stepped into one. There was a sense of something deeply wrong, something wholly unnaturally, about those empty spaces. The sudden silence would envelop me like a cocoon, the rush of voices and vehicles coming from a world away, faint like the tinny broadcast of a distant radio station. The isolation was palpable, and with the isolation came a crawling fear, a watery feeling in my guts and my legs that something or somebody was observing me, leading me on in my search. Then I started seeing them again, 
The glances were always fleeting, titillating. A glimpse of a person turning into one of those cracks in the city. Seconds before I rounded the corner, only to find myself alone in an empty alley. Or a set of footprints leading from a puddle, imprints of bare feet, like those of the boy and the girl, vanishing into the distance as the cold, dry air drank the moisture off the trail. A recently toppled trash can still rolling on the floor without any breeze to push it. I'm sure I saw the blonde girl once again. Then another girl with her dirty brown hair cut short. The boy I, I saw several times, always at a distance, always fleeing from me. I'm sure there were more. My search intensified. I took time off work to visit, to visit the cracks repeatedly. The symbols practically leapt out at me from the walls and floors, screaming to be read and deciphered. My encounter with the first crack never repeated itself, but it was hardly the last oddity I experienced in the cracks. Once near midnight, I found a crack that stretched for a full city block on the map, yet I could only count seventy-six paces from entrance to exit. Against all rationality, it measured seventy-six yards within the crack, but a hundred yards on all parallel routes. On yet another day, I went into one of the cracks, scanning the walls for more of those symbols when I emerged, blinking at the sudden brightness three blocks down from where I'd entered. How could a straight path have deposited me anywhere but directly opposite where I'd gone in? By this point, my search started taking its toll. I'd gone beyond the point of worrying my friends. My phone, once a source of tweets, Facebook updates, and text messages, slowly went silent. My boss had called me in and told me he was letting me go. My job would still be waiting for me if I applied again. He put his hand on my shoulder and looked me in the eye. I like you, he said. You've been a great worker, smart and fast. I don't know what you've been going through for the past couple of weeks, but you're not contributing anymore, and I can't afford to keep you on in the state you're in now. I mumbled something vague about things being bad at home. I was too wrapped up in my obsession to care by that point. I'd gone beyond visiting and revisiting the same sites marked on Owen's map. The week before, I'd found a crack that wasn't on the map something new. Owen hadn't found them all. I could almost sense the shape of things, some pattern in the layout of the cracks, some waiting breakthrough in the symbols. And that's when I found him. I had a lot more time without a job. My search expanded. I found two more cracks, greedily documenting their locations and taking pictures of all the symbols I could find. And then I found a fourth. The sun was high overhead, but the light provided no warmth, like a morgue, I remember thinking, all bright and cold. I rounded a corner on a busy street, downtown. My breath caught in my throat. I felt the familiar tingle. I'd found another one. My heart leapt, but there was something else here. A few yards in, hunched over, was a man, a denizen of the streets from the looks of it, his tattered jacket wrapped tightly around his slight frame to keep out the biting cold. A hand poked out from his jacket, holding the zipperless front together, but I just saw two fingers clutching the dirty material. Some terrible damage had been wrought on his hand. A bandage, gummy with dried blood and pus, covered most of it. I rushed forward to speak to him the first other real person I'd seen in my search. He perked up at the sound of my footsteps. His roomy eyes widened when he saw me. The man raised a sheet of cardboard, crudely torn from some carton or box. I expected to see something routine, a plea for a spare change, or something about being willing to work, maybe even something witty. Instead... Scribbled in large, blocky letters were four words. Run. They hunt you. 
The rough strokes of the letters were too broad to have come from a sharpie or a pen. The ink was a rusty smear of brown, too spread out to have come from a normal writing instrument. Blood. The man had written the warning in blood. Who? I formed the question with my lips, even as the answer rang in my mind, clear as a bell. Owen's voice. The kings and queens of the city. In that moment, my eyes locked with the clear blue eyes of the wreck of a man in front of me, and the dawning realization finally hit me. Owen. Sweet God in heaven, I was looking at Owen. He'd known it was me all along, of course, but he hadn't expected the look of recognition on my face. He'd opened his mouth and moaned, a wordless sound of pure anguish, his mouth wide enough for me to see the black stump flopping around inside like a dying fish. The shock of recognition was too much for me. My knees buckled as I backpedaled, distancing myself from the ruinous vision before me. I toppled over, the resulting impact driving the air from my lungs. The world flashed white as my head met the ground with a crack. I got to my knees, wincing in pain, I raised my head, and the pain felt like a tent spike between my ears. Owen stood a few feet from me, but he wasn't alone. The blonde girl stood next to him, dwarfed by his gangly frame. She held his hand delicately, like a nurse leading the elderly and infirmed. Owen's entire demeanor had changed. Moments before, he had worn an expression of shock and anguish. All that had melted away, and there was nothing but naked fear in his eyes. He shook gently as the girl raised his ruined hand to her lips, planting a kiss on the rotted bandage over his missing fingers. No, not a kiss. I saw her lips work up and down as she sucked hungrily. When she looked up, a smear of brown covered the perfect pink bow of her lips. We're coming for you next. There are so very little of this one left, and there are so many of us. Her voice was clear and sharp, with just a trace of girlishness. She reached up and stroked Owen's cheek softly, smiling at me. Owen shuddered. The crotch of his jeans darkened as he lost control of his bladder. I tried to get to my feet, but the pain was blinding, as the rush of blood to my head whited out my vision again. I blinked furiously, trying to clear my sight. When the world swam back into focus, both Owen and the girl were gone. I rushed forward to the spot where I'd seen him last. Nothing lingered but the faint smell of urine and fear. Like the first time I stepped into one of the cracks, a long, straight concrete canyon stretched out before me. No traces of Owen or the girl. Then the screaming started. The same sound that Owen had made earlier. A sound of pure pain and anguish torn straight from his soul. It seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere. I spun around like a madman, hoping to catch one last glimpse of my friend. He wasn't there. I put my hand against the wall to steady myself. I snapped my hand back. The wall was vibrating, humming. The screams were coming from the walls. I ran. The streets had emptied out for the evening. I'd lost track of where I was, how far I'd run. I felt like a man coming up for air, servicing from the depths of a waking dream. A stranger looked back at me from the glass facades of the shop as I walked past. An eternity ago, I was young, full of life, successful. Owen was the vagabond, the kook, the madman. Now, we were the same, he and I. Disheveled, 
unshaven, with one difference. I was afraid now, afraid of what I'd become, of how far I'd fallen, afraid of what I'd been chasing, not knowing that I was being hunted with a greater hunger than I was capable of imagining. I swallowed a scream of my own as I saw a pale face watching me in the reflection. I peeked over my shoulder. A young man stared out at me from the alley. One of them. The alley was dark. The scant street lighting made it seem like he was floating in a shadow. He beamed widely at me, his teeth white and perfect. Then he stepped backwards and the darkness swallowed him. My pace quickened. Another alley, another crack. Two of them this time, staring out from across the street, their eyes bright with mirth and longing. Is that what Owen saw that night in the bar? Was he being hunted too? I broke into a slow jog and then into a flat-out sprint as the fear took root and grew. Owen was dead now, I was sure of it. I had squandered his first warning, and I feared that his second had come too late. I had to get home, destroy the maps like Owen said, stay away from the cracks, maybe leave town. There is nothing left here for me anyway. Only one thing remains to be done. I burnt the map, deleted all my photos, thrown out the GPS unit, anything that hints at where the cracks are. All I need to do now is leave my story, my warning, and hope that no one else follows me or sees what I've seen. My work is complete. There are cracks in our cities, and dark things dwell within. They lie hidden like spiders, lurking within the web-like fissures, lying in wait for the unwitting, the unprepared, and the lost. And they are hungry. I was sitting in my room fiddling with my phone when the ambulance went screaming past my window and crashed into a utility pole down the street with a wall-shaking crunch. After a dumbfounded moment of shock, I leapt up and nearly tripped over the backpack I'd left on the floor. The instant I'd gotten home, I'd sat down and begun browsing random things online and so had never actually taken off my shoes or settled in. That gave me an advantage now. Fully clothed, jacket and shoes already on, I slammed open my door and ran out into the night. Just as I moved through my short yard, a bright flash starkly lit the avenue and the four small houses across the street briefly burned themselves green in my vision. The disorientation didn't last long, but it was enough to give something the opportunity to burst into flames near the ambulance before I could tell what it was. Full of apprehension, half-blinded and not sure what to do, I jogged rather than ran closer. A hand on my shoulder stopped me. A sharp-eyed older man peered around at the wreck, his glasses reflecting glimmering light blue. Careful, those flames are extremely hot. Smoke began to roil through the neighborhood as the light blue fire oozed in a growing pool in front of the ambulance. What's burning? Studying it from a distance, he shook his head. Uh, it looks like something flew through the uh, through the uh, front windshield during the crash and ruptured on the pavement. Hmm. Napalmish consistency, very hot. It could be a dangerous chemical. As the rest of the neighborhood began tentatively joining us on the street, I looked him over. You an expert on this sort of thing? Academic only, but yes. Uh, I'm Grady, Professor Grady. I'm Evan. I think I've seen your name on the class list. Possibly, yes. He turned and raised his arms to gather our neighbors. Uh, everyone, please be very careful to avoid that fire. It could be uh, could be dangerous. Don't in don't inhale the smoke if it comes your way. Uh, can someone call emergency services? Cast in light blue, the seven approaching faces were as eerie as they were fearful. And I recognized two of them. There was that blonde girl who went for a run every morning around the time I usually left for campus, and behind her was a Japanese-American student I'd seen in two of my classes. He came forward and spoke to me first while the others got out their phones. I've seen you around. I'm O'Hara. Evan. How is the driver? 
Nobody's checked on him yet. What, are we just going to stand here staring? Let's go! Be careful! We'll, sh we'll shout if that burning liquid gets near the ambulance. Together, we crept closer to the growing wall of pale blue fire as it seeped across the street like a closing curtain. The professor had been right. From here, I could see something had broken open upon the pavement ahead. Whatever the container had been, it had begun to melt now, and it hurt to look in the direction of the searing flames. Sliding along the side of the ambulance to partially shield ourselves from the heat, Uhara and I pried open the crumpled door and dragged the driver away from danger. As we made it back to the group, the blonde girl I recognized spoke up. None of our phones are working. Is yours? Several others had leaned over the driver. I pulled out my phone. I'd just been using it minutes before with the battery half full, but now it refused to turn on. No. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Professor Grady checked the man's bloody neck. He's dead. But why are our phones all dead? Scanning the area, it occurred to me that the only light was that of the growing curtain of fire. Limited to one end, the flames cast the rest of the lane in dancing pale blue, and there were no illuminated windows to be seen among our houses. You guys had lights on, right? Several heads nodded while their owner's eyes went searching. Their reaction told me I was right. There was a flash when I first came out here. Hmm, perhaps an EMP. Grady stood before pulling down on his brown jacket to adjust it. Still kneeled over the dead man, Uhara looked up. I don't think this dude is really an ambulance driver. Prompted to explain, he began searching through pockets. There's nothing on him at all except a government card. And even that's just a photo and a number. <laughs> no name? Grady began looking at the wreckage again. Well, if an electromagnetic device did go off, something more is going on. Why are the back doors of the ambulance open? From where we stood, it looked like the doors had somehow crumpled outwards. During the heat, we could see strange liquids dripping from the ceiling within the devastated vehicle and a complete lack of medical equipment. Rather, it looked like a prison car carrying the disguise of an ambulance. Open manacles lay on the floor within, glinting pale blue. It was unclear whether they had been recently used to chain someone. The olive-skinned guy was the first to say what we were all thinking. Did someone climb out the back after it crashed? If we can't call, we should go for help. I can't see any lights. Is the entire city dark? At the edge of the group, a lanky, red-haired boy a little younger than us stood staring off into the darkness. It's eerie out there. No way am I going. Nobody leaves. I turned to Grady because I guessed he wouldn't say something like that lightly. Why? You all came out to the street from your individual houses, right? Many glances were shared, and eight heads nodded while he watched. And none of you saw anyone unknown running from here? None of us had. Do any of you live together? We looked at each other and shook our heads. No roommates happen to be home right now? No, no friends over? Nope. Uh, no. Me neither. These are all singles on this side of the buildings. It's like a split sort of thing. Same over on ours. That's very unlucky. Grady studied our faces. Because there are nine of us and eight houses. Someone doesn't belong. It hit me as I stared at the burst open doors. Someone here climbed out of that ambulance. Behind his glasses, Grady's expression was grim. Yes. Collectively, we took a stunned moment to realize how much trouble we were in. We began to discuss vague notions of having seen one another, and I tried to vouch for the girl whose name turned out to be Sarah, but it was clear that nobody on this street actually knew each other despite having lived together for half a school year. At the time of the incident, we had all been too busy on our computers or phones to have seen much. Worse, 
Only Uhara had brought his wallet outside, and thus could show a driver's license confirming his identity. What about you, Professor? We're all students. Why are you here? Uh, this is my first semester teaching at this college. I'm in temporary housing until I find a long-term place. That's very convenient. Well, not for me. Seeing the tension rising, I stepped forward. Come on, guys, no matter what happens, we can't turn on each other. If there is someone who doesn't belong, that's what they'd want, right? For us to fight? Nobody here looks like a terrorist. Beyond Sarah, Todd, the red-haired lanky guy, broke his silence. It's so weird out there with all the lights off. Why would terrorists EMP our college? I frowned. Come on, nobody's saying it's a terrorist. Well, that may not have been the initial plan. He may have needed to do it as part of his escape. I held my palms forward in an attempt to stop that line of thought. Again, no one said it was a terrorist. Sarah did. Uhara pointed at her only olive-skinned student. It's obviously a kill, right? Sarah's not wrong that the rest of us don't look like terrorists. Akil glowered. Seriously? Do I even have to explain how asinine that is? Hey, I call it like I see it. Akil approached a threatening expression on his face. You want to compare numbers? There are more attacks from white guys than people that look like me. For all we know, Evan's the terrorist. I took a step back. Hey, no- Is that true? Are there more attacks by white people? Rather than facing him down, Akil was suddenly side by side with Uhara. Hey, I, I only know what I see on TV. I just happen to watch different channels than most. I took another step back, suddenly apprehensive. I had nothing to do with those groups, but saying so would mean nothing. Beside me, Professor Grady held out a separating hand and grimaced. Well, there's no TV or internet here, so let's just take stock of what we do know. The ambulance contained a fake driver, a container of some sort of volatile substance, a possibly related electromagnetic device that knocked out the power, and a prisoner that is now among us. You know what I notice? A distinct lack of said device. The technology that caused that green flash. It's nowhere to be found. From his position behind everyone, Todd raised his hand. Well, then that means the former prisoner still has it. Yes. Something about this seemed too rapid and volatile for my tastes. We're making an awful lot of assumptions here. Grady disagreed. There are facts before us, Evan. We can't ignore them. Something is going on here, and we are likely in real and physical danger. Our only hope is to identify the stranger and restrain them until the power comes back on. Cornered by what seemed like a very logical argument, I could only accept it and hope to keep the process civil. Should we tell our life stories or something? See if something doesn't add up? Uhara shrugged. I'm a student. I'm from Brooklyn. What else do you want to know? Does anyone have family nearby we can go to for help? I would. But they're on vacation, and I'm... I'm not going out there. Akil clenched a fist. Life details are useless. Any youth recruited for a mission would be trained to tell a convincing story. Uhara sneered. You sound like you know what you're talking about. It's a real thing in my country. You learn to avoid them. Grady again rallied us. Akil is correct that talking won't be enough. We need to find that device. Let's, uh, let's search each other. Splitting into two groups, we began to search our opposite pairs. I awkwardly patted down Sarah before she did the same in return while sheepishly apologizing twice. None of our nine appeared to have any sort of mysterious technological object on them. Todd stood apart, still staring off into the darkness beyond the houses where the pitch sky formed writhing silhouettes against nearby trees that were only dimly lit by the curtain of fire at the end of our street. The escapee must have thrown it somewhere, or lost it in the crash. We should go around to each house as a group to both look for the device and find our wallets. As we agreed to this, the wall of fire completed a nearly imperceptible shift into pure white. With the blue tint gone, the neighborhood looked almost normal, and we moved as a suspicious group towards the first house. Glancing left and right, I watched for any out-of-place action. 
It appeared that there were eight students and one professor, but how could any of us be a secret threat? Were terrorists recruiting college students now? I put a hand forward and stopped the tattooed and black-haired girl named Olivia from entering what she claimed to be her house. We can't see anything in there. No phones, no flashlights, no way to look around. That fire is the only light. Grady wrapped his knuckle lightly on the frame of the door in frustration instead of going in. Oh, well, you're not wrong. I can't see anything inside, but we have to try. Olivia hesitantly led the way, and the nine of us squeezed into her front room. From this angle, a very small amount of light cast by the fire was making it through the window, so only silhouettes were visible. I moved along the wall with my hand, feeling stacked records and books on shelves. Olivia rummaged along a couch in the dark. It's... it's around here somewhere. Wait, I think I found it. A window shattered deeper in the house. A thud sounded, followed by a grunt. An impact shook the floor and the others began shouting. Trying to discern what was happening, I moved my head back and forth, but all I could see were shadowy forms. My eyes played tricks on me, interpreting certain motions as horrific, misshapen limbs striking back and forth. I realized that someone was under attack. Everybody out! I didn't have to tell them twice. Practically stampeding back through the front door, they left me with a silhouette on the floor, and I dragged the unconscious person out to where Seven stood waiting. By flickering white, I saw it was one of the guys I'd hardly spoken to. His face had been smashed against the wall or the floor or both, and I had no doubt. He's dead. The others stared back in shock. What had been mere conjecture had suddenly become brutally real. Could it be possible that there really was some sort of terrorist or criminal among us? We can't search the houses. Grady stared at the corpse. In the dark, we're, we're vulnerable. Sarah shook her head after a grim calculation. Our best bet is to get in touch with other people. We should just walk to the next street over and find someone. Beside her, Todd shivered. No, we can't. Why not? Todd backed away and held his arms close to his chest. Professor Grady snapped out of his daze. Wait, th that's, that's a good idea. We'll all go to the next street over and we'll ask their superior numbers to isolate us. Without a doubt, one of us is now a murderer. There wasn't much need for further discussion. Leaving the two bodies in the street, we panicked eight began threading our way between the houses. The issue of darkness again presented itself, and at the front of the line just behind Sarah, I halted listening to the night. A strange sort of growling sound echoed around us, and then... Back! The growl became a violent cry and an unseen scuffle. Our screams echoed along the lane as we dashed into white illumination, minus one member. The meek brunette girl whose name I hadn't gotten... Jesus Christ! Uhara paced nervously... Grady stood silent and alarmed. Todd hugged himself tighter and seemed on the verge of crying. Olivia and Akil frantically compared details to try to make some sense of what had happened. Who has blood on them? Who has blood on them? But it was no use. Small spatters had found their way onto each of us. We paced and circled and argued in front of the wall of fire as it slowly grew yellow in tone. Whatever chemical or liquid was burning, it was now obvious that it was beginning to cool. Our only source of light was temporary. The darkness of the night seemed to be creeping closer, confining us to our ghastly yellow street with increasing pressure. I grasped desperately at some sort of epiphany. We've been attacked. We've actually been attacked. Someone used the cover of darkness to strike twice. Which means if we make any more mistakes, any at all, they'll be waiting to do it again. Does anyone have any weapons? I'm the only one that we can be totally certain about. Give me a weapon, and I'll guard the rest of us, Brooklyn style. Well, that might be wise. No. Weapons will just make this more complicated. What if the attacker makes a surprise move and gets a hold of it? We should all be unarmed. Or maybe all of us should have a weapon. Hmm? Make every move dangerous for the murderer. 
it was too late to take it back. Once the suggestion had been made, every one of us grabbed a piece of metal or wood from the rack in nearby yards. Holding them tight and glaring at each other, we formed a circle of tension ready to snap at the slightest misstep. This is exactly what I warned against. Turning on each other only helps the enemy. Oh! Now you think there's an enemy? I angled slightly to face Akil more directly. Yes, we've been attacked. I never said there wasn't a terrorist. I just wanted to wait until we knew more. That's not what I remember. Sarah lowered her long piece of metal and interjected. No, he's right. There's no point in fighting. We're not the police. If one of you is an enemy, just go. It doesn't matter. Looking around our circle, person by person, I waited for someone to make a move. I imagined everyone else was doing the same. After several moments spent at the edge of tension, I sighed. It's not going to work. The stranger won't reveal themselves on purpose. We're all poised to attack them the moment they do. Todd kept looking over his shoulder at the darkness outside of our slowly shrinking region of yellow light. Only the nearest six houses were still illuminated, and he was positively sweating from fear. This standoff can't last forever. Sooner or later, that fire's gonna die, and then someone will make their move. Glancing at Professor Grady, it occurred to me that he wasn't sweating. I could see glinting beads of yellow reflection on each of our foreheads, but not his. Was he just that calm under pressure? The tricks that my eyes had played upon me pushed to the forefront of my awareness, and my ears recalled the growling I'd heard. I breathed with wide-eyed realization. Holy God! It's not a terrorist! Everyone's eyes were on me. I took in the yellowed faces in our circle of suspicion. It's a creature. Did anyone else see that tentacle-like thing striking in Olivia's house? Nobody said a word. <laughs> I pointed. You, Sarah, you saw it. I don't know what I saw! I just think we should wait until someone comes or the phones start working again. Hmm. We may need to find that device and turn it off for that to happen. It may be sitting discarded somewhere nearby, continually pumping out electrical disruption. You're awfully interested in that device, Professor Grady. I think we should focus on figuring out who the creature is. What exactly are you getting at, Evan? There's no creature. As depressing as it is, human beings are capable of violence and murder the same as any imagined monster. It's a shapeshifter. It has to be. Amorphous limbs and the ability to growl changing only in the dark so as not to reveal itself? Come on, think about it. What's all that goo inside the ambulance? Grady's expression grew increasingly stern. Don't foment panic, Adam. This is a factual situation with real strategy and real risk. There's no shape-shifting creature here, only a murderer. Look at the facts. I am. I scanned the group for support. Some of them looked partially convinced. I have a set of facts, and I am being perfectly logical. The intruder among us has to be a shape-shifting creature. What's the goo in the ambulance? Well, how are we supposed to know that without chemical analysis? It could be more of that incendiary liquid. We stood in stressed silence and apprehension for a full 20 seconds as the fire beyond the ambulance descended smoothly into a deep orange shade that somehow made everything both lit and dark at the same time. Thus shadowed, Akil shivered. I'm with Evan. It's, it's not a terrorist. That's just dumb. Let's stick to the real world. I don't want it to be a creature. I'm sorry. Visibly torn, Sarah finally chose a side. I think it's a creature too. I did see something. Sarah and Akil moved near me. Grady, Uhara, and Todd shifted to face us, weapons at the ready. Apart from both groups, Olivia chimed in. Are we going to fight now? Is that it? You're all being ridiculous. Uhara nodded promptly. We'll fight if it comes to that. Yeah, 
That's right. I locked eyes with Grady, who relaxed his stance. I noticed he didn't throw down his weapon. We should find that device. All seven of us should go yard to yard. The murderer must have dropped it when the fire first flared up. I glanced at my team. Agreed. But you don't touch it, since you've been all about finding it from the first moment. Grady's eyes narrowed in a subtle orange-shadowed glare. But he did not protest. In a loose knot, we moved down each sidewalk, yard to yard, peering at bushes and trees by flickering orange. I studied the movements of each of these supposed neighbors, trying to see something alien in their gait, in their unconscious mannerisms, and in their words. But they were all flawlessly human. I would almost have thought we were all who we said we were, if not for the fact that two of us had actually been attacked and killed. The only possibility was that there was really an infiltrator among us. Getting on her hands and knees to reach into a storm drain, Olivia crowed with triumph. Yes! She pulled a strange, spined metal hedron out from below. It was definitely technological, but with an aesthetic unlike anything I'd seen before. All seven of us stared. As she lifted it high, the light of the fire shifted to dim blood red. Uhara pushed Olivia violently and without warning. <laughs> Todd rushed in to back him up, and Grady accepted the handoff of the device before all three ran back towards the fire. Sarah, Akil, and I had managed a few surprised shoves, but our attention turned to Olivia, who lay bleeding from her head against the concrete shoulder of the street. She was unconscious, and it was unclear what we could do for her. As much as I wanted to keep the peace, Vengeful anger overtook me, and I led the charge towards the blood-red flames. The shoving and bashing and stabbing happened in a whirlwind. Todd and Akil fell, too injured to do anything but groan. Sarah and I stood facing Grady and Uhara, each of us bloodied. I know you're the creature, Grady. Uhara glanced once at Grady, but the professor just smiled by crimson light and pushed him back into the flames. With that shove, Uhara fell into the burning napalm-like ooze and died in seconds. Ouch. Grady turned his attention back to me. <laughs> There's no creature, you fool, and no terrorist either. I just wanted this. Grady held up the hedron. We had no idea what its function was, but if it's the massive EMP device I think it is after seeing it in action, it's going to be very useful. Full of rage, I took a step, but he drew a gun from inside his brown coat. Careful now, Evan. Why did you just shoot us before? Why put us through all of this? Grady smirked. I'm a decent shot, but I was sure the eight of you could still take me. It was far easier to present two sets of facts and let you divide yourself and destroy each other. I didn't care anymore. I leapt forward and smashed down with my metal bar, not at Grady, but at the device. Several loud shots erupted and a spear of fire burned in my leg, but I brought the device crashing down to the pavement, where it broke into a dozen pieces. You idiot! Do you know how much money you just destroyed? Holding the gun to ward me off, Grady kneeled down and tried to gather the pieces with his hands, but it was no use. Sour, he sat abruptly down on the street, gun still halfway up. Oh. Bitterly, Grady resigned himself to his fate. The conflict was over, for the prize had been destroyed. Fatigued by the sudden release of tensions, we also sat. As the fire cooled into a small, smoldering aura of colorless light that barely contained us, I nursed my shot leg. The shadows in Olivia's house all chalk up to my imagination. But what was with the growling? I assumed it was just an animal or something. But it wasn't me. I thought one of you did it out of paranoia. A chill ran down my spine. So, you didn't attack us in the dark? 
Grady looked at Sarah and me with growing concern. No! He was growing more visible in my sight then, and I realized we'd made it to dawn. The glorious sun began to crest on the horizon and we watched with relief. But only for a moment. It was not our imaginations, and it was not an after-effect of the bright fire we'd been near all night. All the world brightened and we saw the truth of our reality. It became very clear that all of us had been more than fools. Scattered about on the street, wounded, bloodied, and hopeless, we watched as strange, tentacled, and clawed beasts that had formerly been hidden in the darkness now circled our fragment of civilization. There was no city out there. The device had not been an EMP. No, it had been something else entirely. And it had taken the front half of our eight houses and the majority of our stretch of road along for the ride. There might have been hope if we had done things differently. But we hadn't. We'd been so busy with suspicion, fear, greed, and hatred that we'd spent the entire night destroying ourselves rather than tackling the real problem. The fire was gone now, and so was our time. I clutched my weapon tight and steeled myself bitterly. For once, there was no argument. One fact above all cut through our biases, beliefs, and rivalries. The sun here was green. The clock stood in the hall, one of the truly magnificent pieces of the Walter family's estate. The clock was made of heavy mahogany and showcased a large mother-of-pearl face with hands of sculpted bronze. Each hour the tall clock rumbled in the hall, resolutely calling the hour the passage of time. No one knew who originally designed the clock. Some in the family claimed it was made by an Austrian watchmaker by special commission, Others said it was given to the family many generations back as payment for some debt. No one knew for sure, but it mattered little. The general consensus was the same. Although the clock was magnificent, there was something oddly sinister about it. It was a hard thing to explain, really. It wasn't that the clock was ugly. Indeed, quite the opposite was true. It was heavily decorated with carved cherubs, shined glossy. The face radiated pink, blue, and ivory in the sun, while the heavy bronze hands moved about elegantly, their pieces intricately carved. Even the deep groan of its chiming bells resonated with a kind of stately grandeur. Guests to the house often stopped to comment on its beauty, but only at a distance. Even the most ardent admirers of its artistry rarely approached it directly. Indeed, most people walked by it quickly, suppressing a shudder. Even Nadia, one of Old Lady Rose's many descendants and the current owner of the estate, rushed past it when outright avoidance was impossible. In fact, the only person who seemed able to maintain her nerve in the face of the clock's strange atmosphere was Nadia's youngest daughter, Isabeth. At thirteen years old, Isabeth was the quintessential misfit. She preferred books to play, spiders to dolls, and twilight to midday. Although she was both pale and blonde in appearance, she was a dark spirit drawn to all things macabre. However, even she was not totally immune to the influence of the clock. She'd never mentioned it to anyone, but she'd always felt oddly drawn to the elegant timepiece. Sometimes, as she made her way down the mahogany-paneled hallway, she felt as though it were actually calling to her. She found this somewhat unsettling, but also intriguing. She'd approached the wooden monolith with an odd mixture of curiosity and trepidation. Then she'd stare it down as though she were challenging it to a duel. Sometimes Nadia would catch her daughter in the act, her back rigid, her violet eyes peering into the clock's iridescent face, the way one might stare down an adversary. Nadia was never quite sure what to make of it. What on earth are you doing, my dear? Her mother would ask. The clock. It watches me. Is all Elizabeth would say. 
Nadia was always left standing, awkwardly, in the shadowy hall. After her daughter had gone, she would approach the clock gingerly, trying to feel what Isabeth had felt. But she could never feel anything but the vague uneasiness. Things took an odd turn when suddenly the nightmares began. Each night at 3 a.m., Isabeth would awaken, screaming. It was a blood-curdling scream, the kind that caused one to freeze upright in bed, unable to move. Servants inevitably rushed in to assist her. They always found her in the same posture, in a tight ball under the covers, face on knees. When she was extricated from her sheets, she always seemed oddly surprised, as though she'd been set free from a terrible trap. Then she'd roll over and go right back to sleep, as though nothing at all had happened. This went on for a fortnight. Various attempts were made to explain the sudden appearance of the nightmares, but no solution could be found. When queried, Isabeth could never really recall what had happened to cause her to scream, but she felt, vaguely, that it was somehow connected with the front hall and the clock. After two weeks of disturbed sleep, Nadia became desperate. The staff looked half dead, and she was at her wit's end. Determined to find a solution, Nadia decided that, since Isabeth seemed bothered by the clock, perhaps she should try having it removed for a while. She called some friends at the local antiques dealership and asked them if they would be willing to keep the clock for a spell. They reluctantly agreed. After all, who would want to take on the protection of such an expensive heirloom? Removing the clock was a massive undertaking, but in the end, Nadia was glad she'd gone through with the operation. Almost immediately, the screaming stopped. Indeed, Isabeth slept soundly for another fortnight. After two weeks of peace, Nadia was on the verge of declaring the whole experiment a rousing success. However, she soon discovered that she need not have been so bold. On the fourteenth night, instead of screaming, Isabeth rose precisely at 3 a.m. In a dreamlike state, she walked out of her room, down the upper hallway, down two sets of stairs, past the landing, through the gallery, all the way to the front hall where the clock once stood. There, she stood absolutely still for about ten minutes, and then, as if someone had snapped his fingers, she'd awakened, startled and confused. This was all discovered through pure chance. A servant had risen to get a glass of water because she couldn't sleep. When she entered the front hall, she saw Isabeth standing there in her nightdress. Then, while she watched, Isabeth seemed to stir and look around. It was clear the girl had no idea why she was in the front hall. The same set of events transpired on the following evening. This went on for another two weeks. That's when Isabeth began to see the girl. At first she was a small, clear light, strangely fog-like and murky. However, as time passed, she became more and more distinct. The first time it happened, Isabeth didn't know whether she should stay and observe the strange apparition, or run screaming from the hall in terror. She chose the former, much to the relief of the rest of the household. This went on for some time, the walking, the waking, and the seeing of the bizarre glowing girl in the hall. However, it was tolerated, because Isabeth didn't seem to mind, and neither did anyone else. No one was being awakened at 3 a.m., no one's sleep was being disturbed, and Isabeth rarely spoke of it. Indeed, a kind of routine developed. The only thing that seemed to change was Isabeth's location. Sometimes she was directly across from the clock. Other times she was kitty-corner from it. Sometimes she was down the hall farther. It became a game among the servants to bet on where she would turn up from one night to the next. Indeed, the serving staff drew lots each evening to determine whose sleep would be disturbed. In most cases, the servant who won would have to rise at 3 a.m. and take a peek over the banister to see where she was. The following morning, the staff member would report Isabeth's location on the previous night, 
and payouts would be made. One December night, Susan, the pantry maid, drew the shortest draw. However, her room was in a different part of the house than much of the serving staff because her room was located right next to the kitchen. This is why, when Susan came to the front hall, she was able to see not only Isabeth, but also the little ghost. Isabeth had awakened several minutes before Susan's arrival and, therefore, had heard her approaching. Isabeth turned to look at Susan, but the maid seemed not to see Isabeth at all. She was completely mesmerized by the shimmering light glowing softly at the base of the wall where the clock once stood. Isabeth was completely unmoved by the sight of the ghost in the hall. She'd seen it for weeks. Instead, she looked at Susan and asked, What are you doing up? Who is that? pointed Susan, ignoring the question. The girl, Isabeth answered quite naturally. She comes every night. Does she always look like that? Susan moved closer, calmed by Isabeth's seemed indifference. She studied the strange apparition, unable to take her eyes from the figure of the ghostly little girl who sat with her face down and her knees drawn up. Yes, she's always in that position. I don't know why. Isabeth shrugged. She seems sad. Does she move? Susan took another step forward. Does she speak? I've never tried to speak to her, Isabeth replied. All I know is she doesn't move, and she never looks at me. I wonder if she'd speak to you if you addressed her. She must be here for some reason, mustn't she? I mean, you don't just camp out each night in a drafty hallway for no reason, do you? Susan reasoned. I don't know. Isabeth shrugged again. It's not as though she can feel the chill. For shame, Susan said quickly, chastising her in a harsh whisper. You know not what she feels. True, but neither do you, Isabeth challenged. I, I suppose that's true enough, Susan admitted. A brief silence followed before she spoke again. It is odd, though, her sitting there like that. I feel like she's here for a reason, but I don't know what it is. Like she has something important to say, but she doesn't speak. Maybe you should try speaking to her, Susan suggested. I don't think she'd speak with someone else here. I'm not sure why. Well, maybe I should go back to bed then, Susan whispered before attempting to tiptoe away. Just then the glowing figure faded in brightness and disappeared. She's gone, Susan breathed, walking forward suddenly. Aye, she does that. She's only here a short while, Isabeth answered nonchalantly. I wonder where she goes, Susan said, not really expecting an answer. I've often wondered why she suddenly started appearing. The clock was always there before, wasn't it? It's odd. I used to walk down this hallway after dark all the time, but I never saw her until recently, Isabeth replied. Susan grew brave and moved closer to the wall. On a whim, she began running her hand through the air near the place where the spectral girl once sat. She glanced absently at Isabeth and noticed the girl's confused expression. Slightly ashamed, Susan began tapping on the wainscoting instead. She wasn't even sure what she was looking for, really, except some clue as to where the ghost might have come from or where she might have gone. At one point, as she patted an area of the wall, she was startled by the strangely hollow sound that emanated from it. I wonder what that is, Susan murmured. What do you mean? Elizabeth saw the look of wonder on Susan's features. Is there something there? I'm not sure, Susan answered, before kneeling down to knock more aggressively. She started near the place where the spectral girl had just been seen, and then moved down the hallway, rapping on the wall as she moved along. There was no mistaking it. The area behind the clock sounded different than the rest of the wall. 
It is hollow there, remarked Susan, walking back toward Isabeth. I wonder what it means, Isabeth wondered aloud. There must be an empty space behind the wall, Susan suggested. Maybe the little ghost has gotten something. Maybe there's a treasure. Or maybe a grave, Isabeth countered. Why must you be so morbid? Susan sighed. It's just as likely as a treasure. Who'd bury someone in a wall? Susan challenged skeptically. Someone who didn't wish to be found out, I suspect. Ugh! Oh. Susan shivered, looking up and down the long, dark hallway. Let's talk of something else. Elizabeth merely sighed and began to walk back to her room. Will she come tomorrow, do you think? Susan pursued. Most likely, Elizabeth remarked, not turning around. If she does, I think you should try speaking to her. Try to find out what she wants. Perhaps, was all the answer she received. The following night, Elizabeth awakened at 3 a.m. and walked down the hall as usual. Again she encountered the young girl who sat with her back to the wall, and her knees drawn up. Elizabeth said nothing for several minutes, gathering courage. She pretended her bravery in Susan's presence, but there, alone, with the strange apparition, she was terrified. Suppose the ghost was angry. Suppose it didn't wish to be disturbed. In the end, however, Elizabeth collected her wits and spoke. Why do you sit there? She began in a voice that was barely audible. The ghostly child sat perfectly still, its posture unmoved for several moments. Then, as if roused suddenly, the little head came up, and the face of a young girl was clearly visible in its evanescence. And then a voice, like wind in dry grass. I sit because I cannot stand. I stay because I cannot leave. Elizabeth did not answer at first, taken off guard by the sound of the voice. How often had she shared silence with this little ghost? Now they spoke, two girls in the same hallway, separated by time and life. Why can't you stand? Elizabeth asked finally. And why can you not leave? I stay because I cannot leave. I sit because I cannot stand, the girl repeated. Never one to be sentimental, Elizabeth dove into her questioning, determined to get to the bottom of the child's sudden appearance. Well, how long have you been sitting there? I cannot tell how long I've been here, behind this clock. It counts away the hours, day and night, and night and day. I hear the hours fly away. I imagine that's quite true, Isabeth began, noting the girl's antiquated clothing. But you can't have heard the clock much lately. I know because we've had it removed. It unsettled me so. And what now? asked the ghost. What do you mean? Are you settled? pursued the ghost. Elizabeth paused at this. No, I suppose not. Here I am, after all, bawling about in the middle of the night. But I don't scream any more, at least. So much better for the rest of them, I should think, replied the ghost with a hint of sarcasm. Well, what of you? We're both here at this hour, aren't we? spat Elizabeth. I can't help it, snapped the ghost. Who can blame you for what you see? And then, in a huff, she vanished. Elizabeth was equally miffed. She crossed her arms impatiently and marched up the stairs to her room. The next day she told Susan everything that the girl had said. As she spoke, Elizabeth noticed that one of the older maids in her mother's employ was watching them closely, listening to every word. How now? Elizabeth said rather loudly, staring at the woman. What do you find so interesting? I meant no harm, Bertha answered, rising from her chair and coming closer. I just couldn't help overhearing. 
You're talking about the little ghost, aren't you? I, Susan began, is a Beth Caesar. The little girl? Bertha murmured. Yes, began Isabeth. I think I made her quite cross with me last night. She speaks to you. Bertha seemed surprised at this. Yes, Isabeth answered matter-of-factly. I've never spoken to her, but I too have seen her, Bertha began. Years ago, when I was a girl, like you. I think she only appears to young girls. Girls about her age who come into the hall and the clock's gone. When did you see her? asked Susan. Oh, Bertha chuckled. <laughs> Many years ago now. My mother worked in the laundry back then. I was maybe twelve or thirteen at the time. I remember that the clock was being repaired and had to be taken out. It was a rare thing, I recall. A clock that heavy isn't easy to move, you know. Bertha paused, recalling events. I remember I woke one night, came downstairs, and saw her sitting there. When I asked my mother about her, she hushed me and told me never to speak of it. She was very superstitious, but I was a curious girl. When I could get no answers from her, I asked one of the other servants. It was Miss Watkins, the scullery maid, who finally told me who she was. Well, what did she say? asked Susan. She told me a dismal story, Bertha began, and I'm not even sure I have the right of it. Miss Watkins heard it second hand. It's a very old story. She paused, gaining momentum, and then began to tell the story. She was the daughter of a poor woman in town who came to work in the house. This was a time of old Lady Rose's mother, Julia, mind you. She was in her prime then, not yet thirty, I believe. It was many years ago. Queen Victoria had not been on the throne very long, as I recall. This poor girl was ordinary in every way except she suffered from a sleep disorder which caused her to walk about when she was sound asleep. Virtually every night she rose from her bed and walked the halls. After several years, it came to seem normal, and no one even remarked on it anymore. Indeed, the situation became so routine that the girl actually began sleeping in her slippers so she wouldn't catch a chill from walking on the cold floors after nightfall. What time did she rise? Isabeth asked curiously. I don't know, Bertha shrugged. But very late at night, I think. Just a few hours before dawn. Why? It's at that time she wakes each night, Susan answered, motioning toward Isabeth. Three o'clock, Isabeth remarked. Bertha looked at her for several moments, a kind of sad interest spreading on her features. Aye, so it was with her. She rose, and no one paid it much mind. It became routine, the way a thing will, given enough time. The situation was never cause for alarm, because everyone in the house knew about her condition. However, things turned tragic one winter's night. It was right before Christmas. At that time... Christmas trees were novelty items enjoyed by the wealthy. They were, therefore, displayed in places of great prominence. That is why the front hall was chosen. The location offered not only a wide-open space for lights and decorations, but was also in close proximity to the marble fireplace, where the stockings were hung. Well, on Christmas Eve that year, some thieves broke in, most likely drawn by the prospect of holiday gifts waiting there. You can imagine their surprise when, in the midst of their crime, they noticed a young girl standing in the front door. She couldn't see anything, of course. She was just standing there, asleep. But these thieves would have no knowledge of her strained condition. They would have assumed that she caught them in the act. No one is sure what happened next, but it is widely suspected that foul play occurred. One of her slippers was actually found in the snow, several miles from here. Some assumed she was kidnapped, while others were sure she'd been killed and the body disposed of somehow. I'm not sure when the ghost first appeared, but it must have been several years later when the clock was removed from the front hall again. She's only visible when the clock is removed, you understand. It's said that she always appears in the place where the tragedy occurred. Terrible, murmured Susan. 
Why do you suppose she's always sitting with her head down? asked Isabeth. No one knows, remarked Bertha. She said that she could neither stand nor leave, asked Isabeth. Is that what she told you? Bertha inquired. Aye, Susan interjected. She repeats it, according to Isabeth. It is odd. True, tis strange, Susan stated. Clearly there's a mystery in all of this. Well, there's nothing else for it. You'll just have to speak to her again, Isabeth, Bertha remarked. There's no other way. That night, as before, Isabeth rose at 3 a.m. and walked down into the hall. The phantom girl sat, back against the wall, just as before. A soft white light emanated from her in the darkness. It was both comforting and eerie. Bravely, Isabeth addressed the girl again. Why do you sit there? she asked. I sit because I cannot stand. I stay because I cannot leave, replied the ghost. Why are you not visible when the clock is in its proper place? The clock is more than just a clock. It hides the spot. It hides the spot. What spot? asked Isabeth. A stain? The clock, the clock, you cannot see. It hides the place that hideth me. You make no sense at all, Isabeth fumed with impatience. You speak in riddles. Speak plainly. The clock, the clock, you cannot see. It hides the place that hideth me, the ghost repeated. Isabeth merely shook her head, confused. She paced the floor for several moments, trying to make sense of the ghost's riddles. In time, the apparition disappeared completely, and Isabeth found herself alone in the hall once more. The next morning she told Susan all that she'd heard. Susan considered the ghost's riddles, shaking her head frequently. Suddenly, her face went white. She sat forward in her chair her hand covering her mouth. Have mercy. It can't be. She began. What? Isabeth peered into the woman's face curiously. She said that the clock hides the place that hides her. Old Bertha said that the girl's slipper was found miles from here, but that was just her slipper. The girl isn't gone. Don't you see? She's still here. You mean... Isabeth released the breath she'd been holding. I mean, the clock. It hides where she is. Susan looked Isabeth in the eyes meaningfully. She's still there, in the wall. Who would do such a thing? Isabeth exploded. Ah, oh, indeed. Who would hide a little girl in the wall? And why would they get away with it? Isabeth paused realizing the rudeness of her next question. I mean, wouldn't it smell? How was it not discovered? I don't know. Susan's head moved side to side very slowly. They sat quite still for several moments before Susan seemed to come to life. She took Isabeth's hands and looked in her face almost imploringly. You know what you must do, eh? Tonight you must ask her. You must confirm it. If she says it is so. What we think. Then we must open the wall. Susan answered flatly, as though there could be no argument. Aye. Susan nodded. She's been in there long enough. At 3 a.m., Elizabeth opened her eyes and found herself once again in the front hall across from the wall where the clock once stood. Within moments, she saw the little ghost appear opposite her. Elizabeth began in the usual way. Why do you sit there? she asked. I sit because I cannot stand. I stay because I cannot leave, answered the ghost. Where is your resting place? Far from here? 
asked Isabeth. I think you know. You do. You do. Behind the wall. I am entombed. The ghost replied. Isabeth tried to keep her voice steady as she asked her next question. And who put you there, pray tell? Robbers? The workmen came to fix the clock. They came and took it all away. They saw the wealth and began to plot. They planned to rob the house some way. Isabeth almost snapped her fingers. It made perfect sense. She paced, speaking as she walked. Of course they did. They'd seen the house. They knew its layout. They planned to do it right before the clock came back. Great Grandma Julia would have insisted it be back in time for Christmas. They decided to break in on Christmas Eve. Then they could reinstall the clock in the morning of Christmas Day. Of course, they'd be eliminated as suspects. Who robs a house and then returns to it the next day? But what about the girl? They didn't expect you, though, did they? That part wasn't planned. They didn't know about your sleepwalking. The girl's face was turned downward once more. But how did they? She paused. How did they hide you? Where? In the wall? She asked, finally almost fearful of the answer. The ghost looked up at this. They shared a long, even look. Their faces were so similar. Their ages so close. They might have been friends, cousins, sisters even. Finally, the ghost answered her. This house is old. It's not like new. This is no wall, but another room. You see me here, but not inside. Within you find the place I hide. A second later, she vanished. Another room, murmured Isabeth. It isn't a wall at all. It's another room. There was a long pause as she considered this. How would they have known that there was a room behind the clock? They were workmen, not architects of the house. From the darkness of the hall, she heard the little ghost again. I tell you true. There were not two that came for me that evil night, but three. But three came in to thieve and bury me without warmth or light. A third man, Isabeth stepped forward. Another workman? Another man who come to fix the clock? One who knew the wall was deep. No workman knows this house so well. Only as of privy thus. It was by his hand I fell. Whose hand? Isabeth demanded. If it were a relative of mine, I've a right to know. The earth, the earth, own water's blood. The only male. And then it was like a dam breaking inside of her. The old story. It made sense. All of it. All of it going back to when she'd first heard about her grandmother's Uncle Colin. All of it coming back to her in the oddly vivid way that children recall the stories of long-dead relatives. She remembered Grandma Rose's references to Colin's quirks, his nervous twitches, his inability to relax, the number of brandies he'd drink in one sitting his obsession with the clock remaining in its rightful place in the front hall, the way he'd become angry if anyone started snooping around the house. It all made sense now. She recalled the hushed talk about him, his gambling debts, his trouble with alcohol and women, the way he'd gone to ask for an advance on his inheritance all those years ago, and his parents' refusal. She imagined him planning it all out, him deciding to call in the workmen, men he'd probably promised a cut if it all went according to plan. But one question remained. How would they retrieve the stolen items if the clock was back in its place? There's another way in, Isabeth said it out loud. Of course, there'd have to be another way in so he could go in, get what he needed, and get out again without raising suspicions. 
and people never look right under their noses. Never. That's why they never found the body. She had walked some distance from the wall in her thoughts, but she stopped and turned back suddenly, walking quickly toward it. She put her hand on the wainscoting. Where are you? She asked in a shaky whisper. I can't help you get out if I don't know the way in. The way, the way is here. Just here. A light appeared, glowing softly on the wall just a few feet from where she stood. Just pull the latch, and the way is clear. She moved toward the light, allowing her fingers to roam along the grooves in the woodwork. Suddenly she felt it. There was a small latch, invisible to the eye. Her first instinct was to pull on it, to open the door. But being practical, she knew she must wait until sunrise. Otherwise, she wouldn't be able to see anything, even with the spirit's glow. Wake me, will you? She asked the ghost. At daybreak, I can't see much now. In response, the light glowed more warmly for a moment, and then went out. She noted the place on the wall. Then, moving into the front hall, she lay down on one of several sofas. Just as the sun peeked over the horizon, she woke with a start. It was just light. No one was stirring. She rubbed her eyes, rose, and walked toward the wall. She moved her hand along the wainscoting, searching for the lever that she'd found before. She'd fitted her fingers into the grooves of the wood where the light had shone softly a few hours earlier. Then, suddenly, her fingers caught on what felt like a bent metal nail. She wiggled this, curiously, her thumb finally knocking it loose. There was a sigh of stale air and a creak of ancient hinges as the hidden door made itself known. She pulled forward on the wooden door, suddenly timid. It was very dark inside. She knew she must enter to see what she must see, but she hesitated, fearfully, at the edge of the dark mouth that yawned before her. Do not fear, the little ghost whispered reassuringly. I am with you. A soft light radiated in the darkness, growing brighter by degrees. Slowly, Isabeth entered the room. The air was sour. Dank, stale, heavy. She felt sick in her stomach, but she moved forward. She had to. She felt that. This girl, this ghost, was depending on her in some way. She moved further into the casement. This had once been a private parlor of some sort. There were no windows, except in a small adjoining closet. There were plaster walls covered in fabric, with wainscoting underneath. There were several small couches, a mahogany table, and a trunk pressed against one wall. A trunk. Normally, an item like a trunk would have gone completely unnoticed. She would have scanned the room and made no note of such a thing. But there, in the room, the trunk took on a dark, oddly sinister quality. The words of the little ghost echoed in her consciousness suddenly. I sit because I cannot stand. I stay because I cannot leave. A key lay on top of the trunk. Isabeth moved forward and took the key between her fingers. She contemplated its significance. What it could mean. A heavy hitching emotion rose in her chest, and she found that she could hardly breathe. A tear stung her eye as she leaned down to put the key into the lock. It turned roughly pulling the rusted arm out of the sleeve. She was torn between two impulses, throw open the chest in one swift motion, or run away. She found that she could do neither. She was afraid to flee, afraid to look inside the trunk. She sat there on her knees for nearly a quarter of an hour. Then, turning sideways, she allowed herself to fall limply against the wall. She ran her hand over the lid of the chest, trying to will herself into action. She must do this thing. The servants would be downstairs soon. What would they say to her if they saw her in there? She took a deep breath, gaining resolve. 
Then she took hold of the corner of the chest and pulled upward. She did not turn her head at first. She rose to her feet and took a step away from the chest before turning. Inside, the girl's head was down, her face pressed against her knees. Her hair, once brown, had gone in ashy gray. Skeletal shoulders arched downward over bony legs covered in what remained of a dress. Isabeth scanned the small body and noted that her feet were bare. Why had they removed her slippers? Isabeth looked at one of the feet, pressed flat against the wall of the chest, and then she understood. The slippers might have allowed her to make noise. She could have kicked her slippered feet against the inside of the trunk and made just enough noise to alert someone outside of her presence there, which could only mean... She was still alive, Isabeth whispered, horror slowly spreading across her features. She looked at the horrid visage again. There were tethers inside the chest for securing items before travel. The men had used these tools to keep her largely immobile. Her mouth, all skeletal, was still gagged with the remains of a lump of cloth. She suffocated, or starved, Isabeth murmured. And all the while she could hear the passage of time, seated here behind the clock that counts the hours. That's what she said. How long did she wait here for the rescue that never came. She looked around the room, seeking the little ghost absently. How long did you wait? A week? Ten days? A fortnight? Just then, a click sounded behind her. An adjacent hallway was revealed, illuminated by the rosy glow of dawn's first light. It was lined with several old burlap sacks. Stepping forward, Isabeth gingerly opened a sack a few inches. Inside the first bag, there were several boxes wrapped in brown paper. The Christmas gifts, she murmured. They must have hidden them in this hallway when they disposed of her. She looked over at the girl again, sadly, before speaking again. They must have planned to hide them in here all along. But you changed things, didn't you? She spoke to the skeletal girl. They couldn't risk coming in here to get the gifts with you tied up in here, and later. Later they would not have come in because they were too disturbed by the thought of what they'd done. But there still had to be another doorway. If the clock was put back, they'd had no way to access what they'd taken, dead girl or not. She began moving the burlap bags. She was sure the answer lay in the short hallway. She found her answer in the far corner. There she found a small door knob hidden by some loose wall fabric. She walked closer and turned the handle slowly. The creaking door hinges grinded as the door opened by degrees. She couldn't believe her eyes. She recognized the table barring her exit almost immediately. She was in the parlor adjacent to the front hall. The table's location and height masked the outer door handle. How often had she walked through that parlor, unaware that there was a doorway into another room right under her nose? She had no idea the door existed, and she doubted anyone else did either. She closed the door resolutely, putting her back against it, sealing it once more. Well, I'd say you fouled that up, Uncle Colin, she began. Oh, you killed a child and got away with it, that's true. But you did it for nothing. You never got your hands on any of this treasure, either. Poetic justice, I'd say. She would tell Susan everything when she woke. It would be soon, she was sure. Isabeth walked through the short hallway into the main part of the hidden room again. Out of habit, she scanned it, finding a small clock lying face up on the table. She walked toward it, noting its cracked face. It must have been knocked down in a struggle, she mused. The time on the cracked face read three o'clock. A great heaving thing rose in Isabeth's chest as she gazed at the clock's face. So many years, so many years, trapped inside. But you're free now, she announced through her tears. Isabeth made her way toward the door and stepped out into the front hall again. She paused briefly, turning one last time. 
You need not sit, for you can stand. You need not stay, for you can leave. Then, smiling, she turned on her heel and went to wake Susan. Isabeth couldn't be sure, but she thought she heard the jingle of laughter as she made her way up the stairs. The morning sun made its way through the curtains as winter dawn came on fully. It was time to get up. My neighbor's strange. Everyone calls him Old Man White. He lives next door to me, all alone in this creepy old house. No one visits him, and he rarely leaves. I don't know how old he is, but he must be pushing eighty or more with his stooped-over back and saggy skin that looks like it's just barely hanging on to his bones. He's as thin as a toothpick, probably eighty pounds, wet. When I first moved to this neighborhood, people told me about him, told me all the rumors, that he used to be an important businessman, that he was rich, that he had a beautiful wife who slept around, that he killed her, that he ate her. I never believed them. Just a bunch of silly, suburban gossip. He's probably just some crotchety old fart who keeps to himself. Never thought twice about it until that night. I've got bad insomnia. I can't remember the last time I had a good night's sleep. I always end up roaming around the house, watching TV or working on my projects. One night, the insomnia was real bad. I laid there in bed, wide awake, for about an hour before I realized I wasn't getting any sleep. I got up and went to the window to look at the stars, but I ended up looking at something completely different. The window faces out towards Old Man White's place, looking into his backyard in the back corner of the house. There's a window there, almost opposite mine, looking straight into the kitchen. I glanced in and saw Old Man White sitting at his dilapidated table, gnawing on something. I was mesmerized by the sight of his old, gnarled yellow teeth tearing into that meat like a dog. Drool oozed from the corner of his mouth as his lips smacked silently. I am about to turn away in disgust when I realize something ain't right. What's he eating? And at this hour? I look closer and realize that hunk of meat he's chewing on has got a ring on it, and it looks an awful lot like a hand. That, that, can't be what it looks like, can it? I rubbed my eyes briefly, and when I glanced across the street again, nothing. He was gone. Did... did he see me? Had I just imagined it? The next day, after I finally got some sleep, I tried to rationalize what I thought I saw. I was just tired seeing things, mind tricks, uh, you know, when you don't get enough sleep? Makes you see screwed-up things like your old neighbor chewing on a hand like it was from KFC. Yeah, that's it. Just a sleep-deprived brain messing with me. Nothing to worry about. Except I do worry, because now, every time I look out toward his house, he's there, staring at me, smiling from ear to ear, his nasty teeth bared. He doesn't wave or say anything, he just stares. Every night since, I've looked at his house through my window with the blinds drawn. And every time, he's there, staring, smiling, chewing. It's been a week since that night. I'm trying to figure out what to do about the old fart when there's a knock at my door. My heart pounds. I don't know anybody well enough for them to visit. No family out this way, just me, myself, and I. And the old man. I go to the door and stare at it, deciding what to do. There's no peephole, so I can't check to see who it is. It doesn't matter, though, because after a couple of seconds I hear a voice. I know you're there, Sonny. Open the door so we can chat. It's him. 
I've never heard him speak, but I know it's him. Who else could it be? Despite every instinct in me screaming to run, I opened the door. Sure enough, it's the old man, just as old as ever, still smiling that horrible smile. I ask him what he wants. Just to talk. I know you saw me enjoying my late-night snack a few weeks ago. It's my fault, really. I should have closed the blinds. But I wasn't expecting anyone to be up at that hour or peeking into my home. I watch him, not saying anything. You see, all I want is to be left alone. I ain't heard nobody except those hobos I've been enjoying. And ain't nobody gonna miss them. So here's the deal. You keep quiet about my, uh, appetites and I'll leave you alone. Deal? He puts his hand out to shake. I don't take it. It's weird. This old man is probably as brittle as moldy cracker. I could probably break him in half with a bear hug. But I don't because I'm too frightened. I can't place it, but there's something about him that isn't human. I look at his eyes, and I know that he could kill me if he wanted to. I take his hand and make the deal. For the next two weeks, I stay in my house, leaving only for groceries and supplies. I alternate between panicking about my situation and watching the old man with a strange, sick curiosity. I watch him bring home the homeless people he eats, wrapped in garbage bags late at night, under the cover of darkness. All the while, he constantly toys with me. I see him staring at me at the most random times, always leering with those crooked teeth. The SOB even waved a couple of times. Even had the gall to come to my front door with my mail and ask me how I was doing. As if he didn't already know. I struggle with what to do. I can't go to the police because they won't believe me. I mean, who would believe a little old man like that, who looks like a strong breeze could break him, could ever do something so horrific? I finally realize there's only one thing to do. I have to put him down. I spend another week watching him, this time to learn his routine. When I think I've got it right, I prepare myself. I have to do this. I have to, or he'll never stop. Night falls and my pulse is already fast. I eye the old fart's place like a hawk, watching for the lights to go out. When they do, I wait an extra hour. Can't afford to screw this up. I have to be quick. The time comes, and I slink out my back door, a butcher knife in my hand. I don't have a flashlight, can't afford to give myself away. All I've got is the full moon above in my eyes as they adjust to the darkness. I make my way to the fence that separates our yards, and with a little effort I make my way over it. I creep towards the back door and test it. It's unlocked. Either he's forgetful, or he's so secure in his safety, uh, he doesn't care. Either way, it's my benefit. I open it slowly and make my way in. The door leads into the kitchen and I'm immediately hit with a wave of nausea as the smell of rotting flesh assaults my nose. Glancing around, it seemed normal enough. Then I notice the fridge. I'm suddenly hit with an overwhelming curiosity, and despite myself, I open it and peek inside. It's filled to bursting with plastic bags and Tupperware containers, all filled with the half-eaten remains of people. I can make out loose eyeballs, noses, and even fingers. One container even has part of a scalp, its matted hair pressed against the lid. I quickly but quietly shut the fridge, holding back the bile crawling up my throat. I take a moment to compose myself as best as I can, to remember what I'm here for. 
If I put him down tonight, no one else will end up in a Tupperware container. I make my way through the house toward the front, where I'm sure the stairs are. It's like any old house you've seen on TV, complete with the cobwebs. I find the stairs and carefully make my way up, taking my time to avoid any noises that might give me away. As I get to the top of the stairs, I take a moment to figure out where I am. During the last week, as I watched the place, the last light was always an upstairs room, which I took to be his bedroom. Orienting myself in my head, I head down the hallway, towards the room I'm sure I need to go to. I reach the door, the room I'm sure is his. It's cracked open just enough for me to look inside and see the bed, the sheets and blankets, lumpy from the monstrous thing beneath it. Push open the door slowly and make my way in, the moonlight from the window glinting off the steel of my knife. As I reach the bed, I raise the knife above my head. This is it. Without a word, I bring the knife down, plunging it right in the center of the mass in the bed. I raise it above my head and bring it down again. Same, still true. Over and over, I stab the thing ten, twenty, maybe even thirty times. I finally stop when my arm simply can't stab anymore. I stand there, panting, full of grim satisfaction. I'm thinking to myself, how am I finally free from this nightmare when I notice something odd? Something's supposed to be there, but it's not. It takes a moment before my brain puts the missing piece into place. Blood. There's no blood. Not a single drop. I throw the blankets and sheets back, sending feathers flying as I reveal a mass of pillows, now with holes and gashes from my knife. My heart stops as I realize what this means. Before I can run out of the house, a sharp pain spikes in my heel and I drop to the ground in agony. I look at my foot and see a deep gash Right over my Achilles tendon, as blood pools from my foot, I desperately crawl away from the bed in fear and panic. And that's when I see him. He moves into my field of view from the direction of the closet. In his hand is a knife, now bloody from where he cut me. He sets it down on the end of the table, then he looks at me, those foul teeth showing in that hideous grin. Only now they're not yellow and old. Now they're white. White, sharp, and pointed. In my shock and horror, my mind numbly compares it to the mouth of an anglerfish. He starts speaking, but his voice has changed. It's not that sickly, sweet old man's voice. Now it's deeper and more guttural. Oh, I wanted was to be left alone. To be left to my own devices. Was that too much to ask for? As he makes his way towards me, he starts to change. He stands up straighter, his limbs elongating. The hands turn to claws as the fingernails grow. His face tightens as it lengthens into some sort of animalistic snout, of which I have no animal to compare it to. His eyes turn a solid, glossy black, and his jaw opens wider, far wider than any human can open their mouth. He speaks again, and his voice is even more monstrous. Such a pity. I thought we could be friends. Now you're just another meal. I wonder how you taste. Perhaps if I seasoned you with garlic. As that maw of sharp teeth looms closer. Fear overtakes me. I'm paralyzed as it gets closer and closer, as its hot, rancid breath washes over my face. I remember I still have the knife in my hand. Suddenly, filled with a new batch of adrenaline, I jam it into the thing's eye as hard as I can all the way to the handle. The thing rears back, screaming in agony, and I use this time to get away. My foot's in agony, but the fear and looming death 
is a much greater motivator as I make my way back down the stairs to the front door. My plan is to run out into the street, screaming and yelling my head off to get someone, anyone's attention. But no matter how much I try, the door won't budge. I can't figure it out. It's not locked, but it won't open. As an almost thundering, inhuman laughter booms down the stairs behind me, I realize there's no time. That thing is coming for me. So I hobble my way to the back door where I came in originally. I can get to the street from the backyard. I make it to the door, but before I can yank it open and get out, a fresh agony rips through me as the creature's claws stab me from behind. Oh, God, I can feel it hook into my ribs. It pulls me away from the door, and I can feel its breath of my neck. Now you've made me even hungrier. No time to prepare you properly. I'm just going to have to devour you now. As its fangs tore into my neck and ripped away hunks of meat, I knew it was over. More and more of my flesh was stripped away, and as darkness finally claimed me, I heard the beast speak one more time. Needs pepper. No one believed him, that the monsters were real. His uncle grew frustrated and impatient with the nighttime fears the boy should long have outgrown. His aunt was more sympathetic and well-intentioned, but she dismissed them as being merely nightmares. Only he knew that, at night, the truths always revealed themselves. After the lights went out and all was dark, the silence of his room was broken by quiet scratching and moans. He covered his ears against the screeches, but they grew louder and louder until they filled the air and he could feel them even in his lungs. Then, when a scream threatened to burst forth from his throat and he could bear it no longer, there was silence. Not one sound. It was the same disquieting nothingness as in a forest filled with animals that sensed a new predator. The monsters were still, but he knew they were there. He uncapped his ears and glanced at his little sister, asleep in the bed next to his. Quiet and undisturbed, she'd slept through it all. He envied her peaceful slumber. She always looked like an angel. Then there was another noise. Whispers. She's coming, they said. She's coming. She's coming. There was a sudden scurrying of claws, a mass exodus of creatures retreating beneath his bed and back into the world from whence they came. There was but a moment of silence before a delicate fissure appeared in his wall, dividing it evenly down the middle. The wall began to split, but did not break. It unzipped. A soft mist escaped the scene, illumined by the pale light that leaked into his room. Then the crack parted, and a stunning woman stepped through. She was draped, head to toe, in long ebony robes, in her tall, sculpted headdress cascaded in a waterfall of fabric down her back. Her skin was powdered geisha white, and the narrow folds of her dark eyes were accentuated with black feathered lashes. Her lips were painted with the darkest rouge, her teeth a shiny and stylish black. She was beautiful. He sat up in bed, and she began to glide across the room. My boy, she said. My boy, did I frighten you? He froze in place, neither speaking nor giving any indication of thought, his only movement from his eyes. Yes, I can sense it. You are a fearful child. That is why the creatures come, she said, smiling. 
I followed them to you. Now they are gone, but still you are afraid. He nodded softly. Are you afraid of me, boy? Her intoxicating loveliness drew him in, transfixed him. Yes, he said, quietly. Yes, she said. Then suddenly, he wasn't. She rose into the air and began to float towards him, pausing to hover above his sister's bed. There flashed upon her face, for a moment, what could just as easily have been a snarl as a smile. He could not tell. She returned her attention to him, descending in a graceful sweep until she stood at the foot of his bed. Tell me your fears, boy, she said. Tell them to me, and I shall take them from you. I, he began, I am afraid of the monsters. Good, she cooed. The scratches began again from under the bed, along with quiet whimpers of pain. As well you should be. Those creatures are dangerous things. But he was suddenly unafraid. Tell me more, boy. I am afraid of being nothing, he said. There was a sharp pang as his fear was briefly replaced by pain, and then it was gone. The woman began to glow like a fine paper lantern. She became more and more beautiful and his trust in her grew. More. I am afraid of losing my sister. The girl began to sleep fitfully, small moans and twitches escaping her tiny frame. She awoke with a scream, her angelic face contorted in fear. Get out! Get out! Get out! She cried. The woman's eyes narrowed. She disappeared as the door burst open and the children's aunt and uncle rushed in. What happened? asked the aunt. The little girl was shaking. A witch! I saw her standing by his bed. The aunt clutched the girl to her chest and rocked her back and forth. It was just a dream, my love. It was only a dream. No, it was real, the girl said crying into the woman's chest. It was real. Are you behind this? The uncle asked the boy. You think I invited a witch into our room? The man raised the back of his hand to strike him. Don't you dare! The aunt yelled. They've been through enough. No child of mine would dare talk to me like that. Which is precisely why we never had any... The boy turned away so no one could see the tear that ran defiantly down his cheek. His uncle left, and somehow, amidst the soft murmurs of his aunt and his sister's quiet sobs, he fell asleep. It seemed like only moments had passed when he was awakened by the sounds of the zipper running down his wall. His room again filled with the misty glow, and the beautiful enchantress stepped back through. The boy glanced at his sister's bed, where she lay cradled in their aunt's protective embrace, both of them fast asleep. The woman sprinkled a translucent dust that swirled in a vapor around the sleeping figures and seeped in between the cracks of their eyes. Their breathing slowed, and their bodies stilled. I only help them sleep, boy, the woman said. Tell me more of your fears. I am afraid of my uncle. A small groan escaped from the room down the hall. Yes, she said. I can feel that. But he no longer did. Shall I make him sleep deeply? I can make him go away, just like your fear. No, the boy whispered loudly. No. I am afraid that he will be taken from me, 
like my parents were. He paused for a moment. I am afraid to be alone. Ah, yes, she said, inhaling deeply. That is your deepest fear. Yes. But do you feel it anymore? He thought for a moment, waiting for the panic to overtake him. No, I don't, he said with surprise. Do you fear the monsters? No. Of being nothing? No. Of losing your sister? His chest tightened for a moment as he stared at the girl's angelic form. I love her, and I do not wish to lose her, but I am not afraid. Good. That is good, boy. So, do you feel at peace? Yes. Fear causes pain. I can remove all of your fears, boy, and you will never feel pain again. How? Do you want it? He swallowed. Yes. Then it does not matter how. Turn around. He did. Remove your shirt, boy. He shifted uncomfortably, but did as he was told. Yes, she said, stroking a long talon down his spine. You shall do nicely. Tell me, are you afraid, boy? Yes, he said, his voice cracking. She breathed in deeply. Yes, I can feel it. Then, he did not. She pulled a long, metallic zipper from the folds of her robes and held it out for him to see. And now? Yes, he said, shaking. Yes. She echoed in something between a purr and a hiss. Yes. His shivering stopped. She produced a long, curved needle and a spool of metallic thread. Yes? She asked. Yes, he said through chattering teeth. Yes. His jaw became still. She placed the zipper along his spine. She no longer had to ask. Yes, he whimpered. Yes, be afraid. Then she began to sew. She was gentle at first, then aggressive, feeding off each acknowledgement and cry. Yes, yes, he said, tears streaming down his cheek. And she became more and more luminous until only the blacks of her eyes and teeth, the red of her lips, could be seen. The skin along his spine was swollen, pink, and bleeding. But the zipper shined and flashed in her light with each movement of his small, shivering body. She marveled at her creation. Come, boy, let me step inside, she said, as she began to unzip him. There was a sudden flurry of scratching sounds as a horde of monsters emerged from their kingdom beneath his bed. She is here, she is here, she is here, they whispered. The creatures were a terrifying sight. They were pale from living underground, their claws sharp, pointed, and perfectly designed for digging and hunting, hung in curved points at the ends of their muscular arms. Their bodies were thick, with loose folds of skin that hung from their frames, the legs that carried them thin and knobby-jointed. They had the crooked, protruding teeth of a bulldog and white, cataracted eyes, all of which were trained upon the witch. Go away! She hissed. They surrounded the bed and began clawing at her legs, 
tearing through her paper-thin skin and releasing her light in bright, piercing streaks. No! she screamed. Let me unzip you, boy! Protect me! No, no, no! came a chorus of whispers from the monsters formed a protective wall around him. Please, boy, please! They will surely eat you once they kill me. But I am no longer afraid of them, he said. I feel nothing. Yes, I have hollowed you, and now there is room for me. She fought back at the creatures, slashing them with claws of her own. Black ink began to bleed into her eyes, and a burst of energy shot forth from her body, knocking stunned creatures to the ground. Her glow ebbed, and her beauty faded. Come to me, boy. I need your form. He stood still. If you love your sister, she said, splaying her fingers toward the girl to release the creeping mist. You will come to me. No, he cried. Then softly, I will do as you ask. He stepped forward and turned his back to face her, crying as the witch yanked the zipper down his spine. He stared at his sleeping sister. I love you, he said. I love you more than anything. It does not matter, boy, the witch said as she pulled apart his skin. She cannot hear you. His vision blackened as she stepped inside. He awoke to the sounds of scratches retreating beneath him and the witch's final words resounding through his mind. She is already dead. His heart stopped, and he turned towards the girl in a panic. Mirai? He held his breath, staring at her tiny form. She looked just like an angel. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights